Hello everyone. I hope you can hear me. I propose that we start with our webinar. So please, uh, can Secretariat put the slide uh, so that we can start? Thank you. So, um, very warm, very warm welcome to you all today to already second European Distance Learning Week webinar session. We already had very nice webinar this morning, so I hope this one will be even uh, better. Um, I'm very happy that uh, this is the fourth year of the European Distance Learning Week. And uh, during this week, we have six webinars with 35 speakers. So uh, I hope you will enjoy uh, all the sessions. This year, European Distance Learning Week is organized in collaboration with United States Distance uh, Learning Association. And as well, we have special partner this year, uh, Open Education Learning Association in Australia. So thank you. Thank them for supporting and joining us. Uh, today's topic is challenges on the European and global level. A uh, lot of challenges. Uh, during this webinar, we will try to uh, raise awareness and uh, discussion on some of them. Certainly, we cannot uh, discuss uh, on all of them. Uh, so please, I ask all participants to be active in the chat to ask questions, to comment. Also, I ask my presenters as well to uh, engage in the chat and uh, uh, reply on the comments uh, and questions as well. Um, I'm very happy that I have distinguished presenters today with me, starting from Irina Volongevicienne from Vitatus Magnus University, former Eden president and uh, uh, from Lut Lithuania, uh, and from the uh, Lithuanian uh, Distance uh, Learning Association. Uh, then we have Jennifer Roberts, Vice President for Publication uh, uh, Officer from uh, Open Distance Learning Association in Australia, coming from South Africa. Then we have Dean Hook, USDLA Board Member and President-Elect from America. With us today is also Jonathan Castano Munoz from the uh, European Commission Joint Research Center, Svetlana Knyazeva from UNESCO Institute of Information, uh, of, uh, Information and uh, Technology in Education, also Eden Fellow, and we have Sally Reynolds from AT&T in, in Belgium. So uh, you see, we are going Europe and global as well. And I hope that uh, today's presentation uh, will be of interest to us. Here are the topics and the questions uh, regarding challenges which we will raise uh, within our uh, session. Um, at the end, I ask all of you participants to uh, point out which of the challenge do you find most important. And uh, not to be long, because um, we have, let me see, okay, we have uh, uh, quite a number of uh, presenters and presentation, a uh, very interesting one. I would like immediately to start uh, with presentation, not to lose time. So I ask uh, our first presenter, Irina Volungvicene, to give pre presentation on challenge how to create and ensure good quality materials and courses from the point of online learning in higher education to distance education. So, Irina, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sandra. I do hope uh, you can hear me well. Thank you. Um, and I will start with the first question, uh, which is uh, an eternal question, I would say, uh, but now is discussed in different uh, aspects, different contexts, because one uh, of the merges that is happening now in uh, Europe and globally is the merge of um, 
formal, non-formal and informal learning. And uh, when we speak about uh, quality, and when we speak about quality materials and courses, as was defined uh, by Sandra and organizers of this webinar, uh, we have to take into consideration all of this. I decided to approach this question uh, by three uh, proposals coming, of course, from three different continents that are in partnership of organizing of uh, this week and this uh, webinar in particular. So the first example naturally um, comes from one of those uh, from Australia. And uh, when, uh, when we uh, reflect uh, historically uh, on the topic of quality assurance, we can be all confident that uh, this is one of the topics that um, has been discussed uh, longer than for two decades, um, uh, for distance learning, for distance education, then for open learning, then for open online learning, and etc., etc. So we, uh, the people working in higher education, naturally try to find the roots of the discussion in research. One of the most cited author for um, discussing on different, uh, uh, different aspects that I naturally relate to the quality of learning, quality of uh, uh, learning environments, and also teaching and learning. What I specifically like about it is that teaching should meet learning, or learning should meet teaching in this, in this context comes from uh, Ron Oliver. I'm confident uh, many of you know the author and also later publications on quality topic. And it comes from Australia, available now through ResearchGate uh, from Escalite. So if we look at the research that is dated in 2000, so 19 years ago, we already see very important directions and recommendations on how to uh, ensure quality in, uh, in online learning and higher education and distance education. So here we see design material for independent learning uh, issue. We see learner positive response, personal understanding of new learning theories. We see new learning possibilities in technology-based learning settings, meaningful context for learning, learning activities ahead of content, support for learners, authentic assessment, and other important issues that you might identify in this Australian article. Uh, then I traveled to Europe, and um, I specifically chose MOOCs. <laughs> as one of the peaks in 2013, also published in Open Education Europe. And if we uh, look at this uh, article uh, uh, prepared by uh, Gardia Lourdes, Mayne Marcelo, and S Albert Sangra, MOOC Design Principles and Pedagogic Approach from the Learner's Perspective, I do believe that in Europe we now a MOOC as a non-formal or even sometimes informal learning uh, case, uh, online open learning offer. Uh, we can find also very interesting and useful recommendations in the article, a competence-based design approach, learner empowerment, learning plan and clear orientation, collaborative learning and teamwork, social networking, personal learning environment, peer learning, peer assistance, quality criteria for knowledge creation, interest groups, assessment, peer feedback, media technology enhanced learning. So a lot of important criteria that we already take as common knowledge and understanding today in Europe for the quality approach. And then, of course, I had to travel further to the American continent. And I chose one uh, <clears throat> paper from American Behavioral Sciences uh, Journal. 
there was focus uh, actually on uh, aligning learning analytics with learning design. And I saw that, and I still think that we continue research on uh, uh, using learning analytics, using data, but of course we have a lot of challenges raised today like ethics and other, other aspects that we need to consider. But what I also liked immensely in this paper is that here the authors already talk in 2013 how we should divide the scope of a learning analytics application in learning design and how learning design might provide framework for interpreting learning analytics results as well as design for case-based learning, for example, can investigate how learning analytics can help us to evaluate whether learning design is achieving its intended purpose. Further on, in Europe uh, and in Eden, uh, we had very successful project examples who were working and scaling uh, quality criteria and practices in technology-enhanced learning on uh, how to support uh, authors of um, courses and how to support institutions uh, in um, on institutional level, on curriculum level, and then how to uh, ensure that we don't lose track and continue with continuous professional skill development on identification of quality criteria for our practices, for our practices of applying technologies in education. So I know that such tools and criteria exist. And we have a lot of good examples on that, and we use them. But there are some principles that I would like to highlight. And this would be the highlight of the presentation. First of all, if we learn from research that I just shortly presented and from practices from the projects in Europe that, that we had possibility to experiment with and, and, and practice them, we see quality as a target optimized, negotiated, and agreed by academic community, by learners and teachers. Learning meeting, teaching, and teaching where teaching meets learning. And of course, that they are all in the agreement with learning design in terms of consistency and negotiation. The second highlight is that we actually. Uh, are and should be focused on peer review and collaborative approach. Uh, institutionally wise and um, European wise and maybe global wise, we should think how we should foster collaboration on uh, peer reviewing of what we have and suggesting how we should move on with all our practices. A European proposal for this and European answer maybe to the question how to create and encourage good quality for uh, online learning and higher education and distance learning would be openness. I think this is the key where we started in Europe in 2013. And I think this might be the recommendation uh, to go open that would enable our collaboration, our peer reviewing, and continuation of practices that have been well established. So taking into account that we are quite uh, um, limited in time, I would like to finish here and stay here with you to discuss any questions. Uh, thank you, Irina. Uh, very good point. Uh, I have some questions uh, here in the chat. Uh, for example, how can we approach teachers in order to maybe suggest learning topics or even come up with materials? Question from Radu. The first one. Uh, then we have a comment on uh, uh, to ensure the quality by uh, having independent expert assessment, including participation of the author in professional competitions. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and with student engagement with content, each other and their teacher online 
should be at the heart of learning design of materials and activities. So please, these are the questions and uh, comments in the chat. Can you reply to them? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, to the, the answer to Radu, I see this is an openness in terms of how teachers uh, could be open for students to be engaged. I think, I think this is one of the key questions. Uh, the practices that we have and the possibilities that the technologies allow us to improve definitely outline uh, the agenda for us as teachers to create platform in our courses for students to create knowledge, to generate uh, uh, collaboratively new ideas and to suggest uh, student-led curriculum. I think this is the way to, to it. And I think we are on the way if we open our experiences to colleagues globally, Europeanly, then then we can uh, learn how to do it in Eden, we can definitely have good examples. The second question is about expert assessment. If we become experts ourselves in our communities, if we learn from each other, this is a good approach. If we invite experts to help us and collaboratively support us towards quality improvement, uh, this is a good approach. If we have expertise for evaluation and assessment, I don't think this would lead, lead us to any, any long-term exit. And I lost the third question. I don't know if we have time to answer it. The last one from Anna with student engagement uh, with content and uh, teachers and between each other. Uh, yes, I, th I think this question is slightly related with the first one from Radu. I think teachers should take the position openly to invite and involve learners in co-designing and co-developing curriculum and uh, to set the limit of how and where it is possible, I think, the, the decision behind the institution and the teacher. Thank you, Irina. Uh, definitely going open, uh, opening uh, your work to others will definitely in enhance all of us to uh, think about what we are doing, what we are presenting, and the comments we can get as well can uh, an, uh, enable us to be even better. So I thank you now uh, with this question, with this challenge. We are now moving to the second uh, presenter. Uh, Dean Hawk from uh, USDLA. Uh, Dean is going to talk about how to protect respectable institutions and good quality programs from the fake ones. Uh, we know that today we could find on the internet relatively uh, big amount of uh, uh, fake uh, online courses, uh, online programs, uh, diplomas. Uh, and Dean. What is your answer uh, to that, and how can we uh, protect uh, ourselves? Sandra, thank you very much, and welcome from, from Bloomington, Indiana, in the United States. Um, this is a subject that traditionally the university faculty don't get into much, but administrators become increasingly worried about the um, the whole issue of fake colleges and fake credentials is hundreds of years old. And I am a bit of an expert almost by accident on this subject because of my involvement um, in getting involved in the accident scandal back in uh, 2015. I'll get into that a little bit later. Move forward. The question is how big of a problem is this? And to give you a little bit of background by the name of Alan Insel, who some of you may know, who recently in an article discussed diploma mills and counterfeit operations. And this gives you a sense of scope. As you can see, he stated that he's been an expert in the field of 40 years, and indeed he has. He was involved in one of the largest breakup of um, United States bogus schools in the 1980s and the 1990s. Yet, after even that breakup, there has, he believes there's at least 5,000 diploma mills in operation today worldwide. 
And one of the parts that most people don't pick up on is that there are at least 1,500 accreditation mills, meaning associations that say that they accredit groups and what they're doing, of course, is accrediting bogus universities. In addition, there's at least 500 counterfeit diploma and websites, people that'll sell you a degree um, from any school. They just make a copy of it and do something. Uh, and there's review sites. It's a rather remarkable, and by the way, a very profitable business. <clears throat> Our friends at WES, which is the World Education Services, also state that this is a rather significant issue. They, about two years ago, were able to identify 2615. So you can say that the number is between easily 2,500 to 5,000, at least 400 diploma mills, 1,008 in the United States alone, and that number is probably higher. By the way, the UK is the second largest group. And they state that the issue is at least $200 million in the U.S. diploma mill business alone. And again, frankly, I think that's an underestimate of the issue. This is becoming more and more of an issue, and it's an, is it's an issue not only for students, but for the institutions themselves and employers. <clears throat> and we're seeing more and more of the media becoming involved in this. For example, you recently had on the BBC a uh, documentary about uh, the accident scandal and the fake universities, and of course my favorite university, Nixon University, which does not exist. And this was a part of a massive scandal that was hundreds of millions of dollars. BBC did a piece on this back in, I think just recently, within the last year, if I remember right. A little bit of my involvement. I was involved working with al Fanar, which is a publication that is an Arab-English higher education publication, uh, by the way, based out of London. And I worked with their reporting team in identifying potential bogus universities in 2015 while I was out in the United Arab Emirates working for a university and then later becoming a higher education consultant. And at that time, we were going after a group called MUST University. But as this evolved, uh, Benjamin Plackett, who was their reporter, and I found out, of course, it was a much wider scale. And at the same time, the New York Times was involved as a separate investigation. And we all ended up in the same place, which was a group that was called AXIS. Most of you don't know them, but they are a Pakistani base group, they had 335 different higher education programs out there by various names, high schools and universities, all using lovely English sounding names from America and from the UK that made them sound legitimate. And it was more than just that. They had telemarketing teams located in at least 10 different countries. They also had... Um, in their uh, safety box when it was raided by Interpol. There was diplomas signed and United States documents signed by then Secretary Kerry and Secretary Clinton, as well as others to show legitimacy, which of course had all been faked. And then I began writing about this issue because I got involved accidentally when I saw what I thought was a bogus news release and which I contacted the accreditation group and they immediately tried to sell me a PhD uh, because I was supposedly a smart guy. They were going to give it to me at a discount. How smart was that? And that's kind of what started a lot of this. And I began writing on this issue and it's become rather a bit of a crusade for me ever since because even though we helped bust some large groups, it didn't really stop it at all. It just slowed down one group. As you can see, this has been, most people think of this as an Arab-African type of issue, and that's not true. Um, they are one of many that are preyed upon, but it's people that are desperate to get their degrees and people that at times are trying to take a shortcut. And while they shouldn't do that, 
this shouldn't be happening as well. It also turns into a game of extortion, I must admit. So as you can see, even in the Gulf News, they talked about it and other places. So this is a worldwide subject. The question becomes, what can you do about it as universities and as the public? And with that, uh, we started working on this, and I was actually asked by Ministry of Interior to get involved in this for a while. And one of the things that we started trying to do and encouraging government to do is to begin prosecuting bogus schools and its leaders. It was a starting point. Uh, we were able to get the government's UAE's attention, but also Kuwait's, Oman's, and others who began taking this issue more seriously. And as you can see, 50,000, while that is something, 50,000, 500,000 dirhams is of like a fine of 133,000 U.S., something like that. What it has evolved to, and I think this is interesting, is that now they're starting to sanction meaning fines of employers and recruiting firms who are um, putting a great deal of pressure on hiring people with certain degrees and at times get very involved in not checking the credentials of their own particular um, people. So you see more and more people with false degrees, including medical doctors, that have come into a country, and I mean in any country, um, with false degrees. And government now is starting to look at new ways to go after that. And sanctioning of the agencies and the employers themselves is becoming more prevalent. One of the things and one of the worst offenders of this is the people that make the money on this. And while I love these four companies and I use them a great deal, what they do to try to stop bogus schools is nothing. And in my opinion, it's pretty simple. It, it has to do with the economics. They, they make money off these and they can at times indicate ignorance. We need to have these four media companies in particular begin vetting advertisements from universities and rejecting the ones that come from false groups. We also need to increase public awareness with the media, which I believe is happening more, BBC, Alpha R, Chronicle Times, etc., the English paper publications, they need to be doing this. But as most important is our own community. We need to be taking more of a lead in exposing bogus schools via the media and lobbying itself. As associations, we do carry some power of persuasion. And our associations, number one, need to vet out anybody who may be well there, but also to be able to, at times, become a source. How I became involved in this is I was a source to help provide and expose some of these groups. And our associations themselves need to be doing this more and more and being aggressive about it. It is a place where we can do good. And I think that is where I will stop, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that we have. Thank you, Dean, for, for very... Uh, I, I cannot say I'm so astonished how big it is, actually. I know about that for some time, but I'm always surprised how big proportion does uh, this have uh, taken. We have a question uh, here in the chat. Uh, considering uh, the ease with which you can spread fake ads on programs and universities, is there a compendium to learn to easily distinguish your reality from a fake? Question from Angela. And my question would be, uh, why do people uh, enroll into such uh, programs uh, and universities uh, if they know it's fake, actually they found out it's fake uh, after some time, don't they? Two very good questions. Let me answer the first one from Angela. Uh, Angela, there are groups that you can go on to their sites, and um, who is it? John Bear, I think, is the one that is most well known in the United States. And there is also another group, I cannot remember their name right now, they try to keep up with this, even though the numbers are so big at times, they don't know. What they probably do best is know the groups that claim that they are accreditors or certifiers. Um, but if you punch in um, 
state universities um, websites, you will immediately run into them, and they do provide good information. Sandra, on your question, you know, that's the one that's troubled me for a long time. But when I was involved in the accident scandal, I ended up talking with a number of these students as I was investigating and involved in this, as well as some of the people that worked for Axe. By the way, um, and there's a combination here. People who are desperate to improve their jobs and things, and this is what I saw out in the Middle East, will try to take a shortcut. And I think on the most part, they do know it. Um, but I think they're trying to do it to get promotions, and it's usually within a field that they already know. That doesn't excuse them. But what it does is put them in a trap. And let's say, Sandra, that you decided that there was a new position and somebody gave you kind of a quote-unquote easy way out and kind of made a moral justification for it, and you spent some money to do it. What happens next is you're in a trap that you can't get out of. What will happen is that they will call you after you've done it, maybe six months, maybe a year from now, and they say, we're having to move your degree to somewhere else. And you start asking questions, well, you mean this is fake? Then they say, well, there were certain problems with this group we didn't know of, but for another $5,000, we'll take care of this problem for you. And what if I don't? Well, then we'll inform your employer or the police, and you'll lose your visa. So it becomes extortion. And like I said, I don't think I talked to a single person that didn't say I didn't know. I think most of them said I sort of knew, but I was trying to take an easy way out. And while that's not a good excuse, the people that extort people like this are the ones we should go after. And that we start taking away some of those opportunities. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is also, I would say, a question of uh, honesty and decency. We have to take in consideration, I would say, the culture that is changing and that today we are sometimes forced to take some easy uh, ways in order to preserve the jobs, but nevertheless, the, the, the issue of honesty is uh, important. So, yes, I agree with you. We should. Uh, speak uh, openly about these fake uh, university programs and let them know uh, that, uh, and let others know that these are the fake uh, in order to expose them uh, and, uh, and uh, make them. Uh, and, and Sandra, one last comment on that very quickly is that yeah. universities need to be aggressive about this, meaning in the public. They need to show who the bogus ones are. They need to show the leadership as well as our own associations. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you, Dean. Uh, please, uh, other participants and uh, presenters, please uh, continue collaboration and comments in the chat. We are now moving to the next presentation from Jennifer Roberts from uh, Open Distance Learning Association in Australia. Uh, she will talk about how to keep learners' attention on the course uh, from the per neuro neuroscience perspective on effective strategy for students' engagement and creating a sense of belonging. So, Jennifer, please. Thank you very much. And um, thank you to everybody for joining us this afternoon. And I'm speaking to you from sunny South Africa in Johannesburg. And today I'm talking about creating a sense of belonging. Um, and I'm wearing two different hats here. My first hat is that of Vice President of ODLA, which is the Open Distance Learning Association of Australia. And in addition, I'm a research professor at UNISA, which is the University of South Africa. So according to research, students are concerned about three things. And that is the quality of their academic staff, their actual study program, and most importantly, a feeling of belonging. They need a sense of belonging. The sense of belonging is a basic human need. And according to neuroscience, physical pain and social pain use the same neurological pathways. 
And the language we use to describe social pain is the same as the language we use to describe physical pain. So what we're saying here is a sense of isolation or sense of social isolation can be as painful to a student as normal physical pain. I've recently returned from um, the ICDE in, in Dublin, and one of the themes that came through very strongly was the sense of belonging, and the sense of the I, the sense of the person, the sense of identity that students need. So if we look at it in context, we've got a couple of problems. Distance education students traditionally work on their own and in isolation, and we all know this, and that's according to the transactional distance theory and various other things. Um, so we've got students who are working in isolation. But there's research that shows that interaction treatments into distance education in co courses impacts positively on student learning. So we're saying here, by getting the students to interact, it can improve their learning. So I want to take this one step further and uh, Jennifer, we have lost you. Can you hear us? The you have frozen. Uh, we have lost Jennifer. She had to come back to the room, so please give us a second. We are still waiting for Jennifer to come back. Uh, oh, we had some technical issues. She has lost connection, so she is now relogging into the room. We'll give her a minute to relog so she can continue. Okay, I apologize for that. There are problems with my, my Wi-Fi here. So um, if you're still with me, then I can continue. So I was saying that just students traditionally work on their own. There's research that proves that interaction is important. And one of the strategies that can be used um, is cooperative learning. So learning is a social process. And knowledge is developed and negotiated between members and it's intertwined with personal and group identity. And here I think it's quite important to look at a few of the words. We're saying between members, that is sharing and cooperating. It's intertwined with personal and group identity. Personal and group identity important. And Paloff and Pratt suggest that the formation of online learning communities is what distinguishes online learning from simple correspondence courses and leads to enhanced student outcomes. So the challenge, therefore, for, for us, and for educators is to create a learning environment that supports diverse identities and experiences of students and fosters constructive and respectful dialogue and exchange. And here I want to just um, mention the diverse learning identities and experiences. And I'm going to give you an example here from my own university, the University of South Africa, which is a fully distance education university, and we have close to 350,000 students. And let's look at, we, we, we always refer to non-traditional students in terms of various variables, but let's look at um, language and how, how variable that is. At UNISA, only 19% of our students are native language speakers, so first language English speakers. Many of them, English is actually their third or fourth language. And just to add to it, we actually have 11 official languages. And you've heard me correctly, we have 11 official languages. Our medium of instruction is English. So we can see just in our own student population that the variety of languages that we have. In addition, our age grouping is, is quite different. 56% um, of our students are under the age of 30. 15% of them are already over age 50. And um, in the next slide, there, there's a slight mistake. It's 62% are employed, and, and the balance are not employed. So we have a large number of students who are unemployed. Um, around the world, we see most distance education students being employed and studying part-time. In our context in South Africa, 
a third of students, almost a third of students are actually um, um, unemployed. And again, as in Australia, we have a, a large rural community. And in these rural areas, they don't have access to learning centres, uh, but we do, in most cases, have access to technology and Wi-Fi. So, we're saying that Distance education students are dispersed in terms of geography, language, age cohorts, etc., and therefore have differing points of view in terms of politics, worldviews, and many more. And by exposing them to these differences in a structured, positive, and constructive way, this is crucial. And here I'm emphasizing a structured, positive way. And that's where cooperative learning comes in. It is not just putting students into groups and leaving them. It is structured and positive. Okay, learning can take place three different ways. First of all, you have individual learning, where the, the, the student is there for his, himself. He's there to learn, to pass, get his degree. Jennifer, we have lost you. Are you here? We have lost again the Jennifer. Uh, well, let's see if she can reconnect again. Okay, I hope she will manage. Come back. Well, we have some technical issues, so she's... Jennifer, are you back? I, I am back. I'm not sure my camera is working, but I am back. I'm going to try to start... There we go. I apologize for this, but I haven't got too much more to do. So we've spoken about competitive learning, and then thirdly we have cooperative learning, where we think or swim together. Okay, so what is cooperative learning? It was put forward, the theory is put forward by the Johnson brothers in the United States, and it's not a method of just going into groups. There are certain areas that are really important in, co in cooperative learning, and one is that there is a facilitator involved. So the course leader, um, the facilitator of the course has to be involved. You're not just put into groups and left on your own, and your groups are heterogeneous. So we are including people in the groups from different languages, different cultures, different ages, um, different areas, to bring that diversity to the group. But according to the Johnson Brothers, for a cooperative learning group to be successful, there are five elements that are essential, and that's positive interdependence, promotive interaction, individual accountability, interpersonal skills, and group processing. So cooperative learning is students helping other students to learn, and it's not students learning on their own. So let's look at the five elements very briefly. Positive independence. This means that every member of the group views their role as part of the whole team, and this is where the facilitator comes in. Everybody has a role to play and it's towards the success of the whole team. Your role is pre-designated. Um, you could be the timekeeper. You could be the scribe. But you have a functional role, and everybody appreciates each role as much as the other. Promotive interaction, which I think is the very important one, and it's always been that you don't work isolated and do your little part of your project and then just come together. There is continuous face-to-face -face interaction, as it was in early days, but I'm in discussions with the um, Johnson brothers, and we are working on research now that is proving that online interaction is just as effective as face-to-face. -face. Individual accountability. It's not only the group. Each person has to succeed. Every individual learner has to succeed in order for the group to succeed. If we go back to the neurosciences, one of the most important strategies for effective learning is teaching. So we have a group where one person is weaker than the others. The stronger people will teach them and get them up to scratch, and thereby enhancing their own learning. Group processing is incredibly important. Members learn to reflect on their own personal learning as well as group functioning and their cognitive skills. And this ties in with what John Dewey says is we do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. 
And your final one is it promotes interpersonal and small group skills, such as leadership, decision making, trust building, problem solving, and motivation. So if we conclude it all together, we sit with the, the, the concern that students feel isolated. They want to belong. They are isolated for various reasons because of their different demographics. We have the technology to enable online communication. And one method we can use is cooperative learning, which leads to connecting students, promoting group identity, and improving learning. Thank you. I see there's one question here saying, how can student interaction be effectively promoted? And I think it can be effectively promoted when the students really understand the benefits. And there's so much research here, we have to teach them, we have to show. A lot of people don't want to work in groups. It's got such bad connotations. But if we can prove them of belonging in terms of their increased learning, then I think that's the way to go. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Jen. Thank you uh, for really, really good presentation. Uh, please continue uh, in chat, replying in chat, chat on the comments and the questions. Uh, we have to go on. Uh, we are a little behind the schedule. So um, uh, I will now ask Jonathan Castano Munoz from European Commission Joint Research Center uh, to give us presentation about how important MOOCs are for the education. Empirical, empirical evidence on MOOCs so to their future importance for different purposes. So, uh, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me well? Very good. Perfect. Thank you. So, following with the discussions we have started about distance learning, I'm going to cover the topic about the future of distance learning namely about the future of massive open online courses about MOOCs. I manage this? Okay. So it is clear that MOOCs have been growing during the last years. There are here some numbers. There are currently more than 100 million learners from the beginning and 1,000 courses. It's a lot. All in the last year, 20 million learners signed up for a MOOC, according to the EU. European MOOCs Consortium. But on the other hand, they have been also signaled as a fact. So we don't know if they are going to stay with us in the future or they will go. In this presentation, I will explore some topics that can play a role to shape the future of MOOCs. For this, I will show some research results and some existing initiatives linked to each of the topics that I will present. The first topic I'm going to explore is related to the providers. Why do higher education institutions or other providers um, do MOOCs, provide MOOCs? If we explore why universities engage with open education, it is clear that they declare that they want to increase the institutional visibility. This is one of the goals. Additional research also shows that it works, that institutions that offer MOOCs next year, next academic year, they have more enrollments in traditional courses, not in MOOCs, or in open education MOOCs. So why they should they stop offering MOOCs? Well, uh, it would be possible that MOOCs are not effective tools for skill development. In fact, some research show that online learning does not work better than face-to-face -face, face -face learning instruction. Also, the research show that MOOCs have poor instructional design. And it can be a problem for skills development. 
However, research also shows that learners their own things that MOOCs are useful for acquiring skills. Some research that we have conducted here at the Joint Research Center show that workers taking MOOCs are more likely to remain employed in the future compared with these workers who don't take MOOCs. So they have a reskilling up, up skilling capability. So we can conclude that they are a good tool for providing skills, even they don't have a very good instructional design. They can have also indirect effects. Um, teachers usually are, um, are a, um, a big, um, they participate a lot in MOOCs. They accept well this, um, uh, this training format, and most can be used for teacher development, so as that they provide better, better teaching and they provide better skills. So they have an indirect skills on provision of skills also. Another aspect that uh, can configure the future of MOOC is its recognition in formal education, but also in labor market. Recognition is still a challenge. MOOCs offer several certificates and recognition options. Some MOOCs don't have certificates or the only completion certificates. There are the nano degrees, the series, programs, specializations, and the more formal would be provide credits for MOOCs. For this, usually payment and uh, identity control is needed. One European initiative working to solve the lack of recognition of MOOCs is the common micro-credential framework of the European MOOCs Consortium. This framework allows the recognition of MOOCs by universities if the MOOCs meet some conditions. These are the conditions. They have to, be, they have, to have a duration of 100 to 150 hours, be in the level 6, 7 of EQF, have a summative assessment, verify the identity of the learner, and they transcript certificate the content, the learning outcomes, the hours, etc. Another, maybe less specific initiative, is promoted by the European Commission and is the EU uh, European Universities Initiative. That initiative promotes the interuniversity campuses, student centered curricula, and multidisciplinary approaches. This means that it opens the door to for, give some room for MOOCs recognition, but it's not a specific objective of the initiative. However, digital learning and MOOCs are mentioned as a priority area in education and skills for the new commission. Another aspect that can shape the future of MOOCs is the, the capability of MOOCs to improve access to education. For now, learners are privileged with higher education and mostly from Western countries. And one can, can, can question why, why this is the profile, the typical profile of MOOC learners. But there are some barriers that impede other populations to participate in MOOCs. One is language and context, other is the variety of offer, the other is the availability of time and the competence, the competence of the learners. And there are some initiatives that are dealing with this. So for language and context, for instance, we can find automatic translation projects, international collaboration. However, it is important to note that research that we have done here at the Joint Research Center shows that there is some transferability possibilities across different labor markets. So taking MOOCs produced in one country is also useful in labor markets in a different country, always that they share the same language. For instance, Spain, Latin America, France, Africa. Variety of offer and design. Um, another variety is that um, MOOCs should offer different levels, not only higher education, use different pedagogies and have different designs. In some cases, including blended learning components. In this way, they, they should or would reach more more variety of students. At the Joint Research Center, we conducted a study it's called MOOCs for Inclusion, where we studied how MOOCs can reach uh, migrants and refugees. And we, we concluded that there are several design aspects that are very important for migrants and refugees and are not usually taken into account by mainstream MOOCs. A recent paper by Sarah Lambert 
also shows how non-mainstream MOOCs are better suited for learners with low educational levels. So variety is very important for extending access to MOOCs. Competence. European Commission defines eight key transversal competence and at least four of them are needed to participate in MOOCs. These are digital competence, learning to learn competence, entrepreneurship and sense of initiative competence, and communication in foreign languages if you want to take a MOOC in a different language. This is a MPLA graph that shows empirical results that shows how the highest and the higher is the digital competence of the individuals, the more MOOCs they have participated in the past. In the European Commission and the Joint Research Centre, we, we are working towards the development of some of those skills in Europe. We have developed some frameworks that define the competence and are useful for its further teaching and training. So we define the entrepreneurship competence, the digital competence, the life com competence, that is learning to learn competence, basically. And, and we define conceptually it so as that it can be integrated in the curriculum. Well, another barrier is obviously time. Adult learners have a lot of time constrictions, and research show that workers do not, uh, they do not have employer support when they take MOOCs. And normally, it's individual responsibility to take MOOCs. Employers even don't know about participation of employees in MOOCs. And obviously, learners could appreciate actions oriented to, to the facilitation of participation of MOOCs on working time. It's very difficult to combine life, uh, learning, and work. So as conclusions, I think, and this is my personal opinion based on the research and the, the initiative that I have been explaining, that MOOCs are not a fad because they are growing, because they are effective higher education marketing tool, because they are effective skills development tool, and they have room for improvement. In fact, MOOCs are dealing with uh, the main problems that they are facing and starting to be more and more recognized by higher education, but also by labor market. And they are starting overcoming barriers for reaching more individuals than the traditional MOOC learned. So the conclusion of all this would be that MOOCs have future, always that they are able to overcome the barriers that, it, uh, that impede their, their growing. I would stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And some very, very interesting uh, uh, conclusions and perspective uh, on, on the research. I especially like the, the issue uh, MOOC in working hours. Uh, I would definitely like that my institution support me to take uh, my training in my working hours, not outside of my working hours. But definitely MOOCs uh, are here to stay and then and they can uh, take it and they can enhance uh, your learning experience. Uh, we have some uh, comments and questions uh, um, in the chat. Uh, but uh, basically people are saying that we should uh, leave the traditional classroom and face-to-face -face learning is one thing and uh, that uh, online uh, MOOCs uh, are also uh, good, but as additional, uh, additional way of uh, uh, learning. So, um, I am um. correctly here um, uh, that, uh, let me see uh, what kind of MOOCs, uh, if you have attended, uh, okay. Some of MOOCs are recognized at work, but uh, let me let me ask you a, a, a question. A very very good idea that we have recognized uh, uh, that we are going to recognize MOOCs uh, as a way of, of uh, education. Uh, why do you think it ha it takes uh, a time uh, so that uh, it become uh, more recognized in higher education? Well, I think it will. Uh I'm not expecting that it will take a lot of time, especially if initiatives as European universities or the European MOOC consortiums start to work um, 
in team, let's say, across universities that they can recognize and they move of each other. I think it's a matter of quality control and a matter of trust. Uh, if you can take a move, but if the university where you want to get it recognized don't know about the quality, never is going to recognize it. So you have to follow the standard quality assurance mechanisms so as to get it recognized. Once the quality is guaranteed, also the labor market is going to start recognizing it as a way of life for learning. Indeed, our research show also that face-to-face -face training and MOOCs provide the same, they have the same impact on employability of persons, of individuals. For me, that was a surprise because usually face-to-face -face, uh, professional development is mo much more recognized than, than MOOCs. But MOOCs are very useful for learning skills. Maybe not for having a certificate until now, for the moment. But it seems that they go in this direction, grow in the quality, and will be become will become recognized. Uh, good. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. You have a question here in the chat by Denise. Uh, I suggest you reply in the chat uh, as we uh, now need to, to move on. So please continue collaboration in the chat. Thank okay. you for your participation. Uh, I will move now to Svetlana Knyazeva from UNESCO Institute of Information and Communication Technologies in Education. I apologize, I skipped her, skipped her previously. Um, she will give presentation about UNESCO initiative on futures of, the, uh, of education, opportunities and challenges ahead. So Svetlana, welcome and floor is yours. Thank you, Sandra, and hi everybody. So, um, Christina, may I ask you to start this uh, short video if possible now? Okay, Secretariat will then play a video first. What kinds of what futures do we want to shape? Accelerated, Accelerated climate change. change. Artificial intelligence and biotechnology. Increasing exclusion and fragmentation. Our world is becoming more complex and uncertain with many disruptive challenges. Knowledge and learning are humanity's greatest renewable resources for responding to challenges and inventing alternatives. Yet, education doesn't only respond to a changing world. Education transforms the world. But to create the futures we want, we must rethink education. UNESCO has launched a global initiative to reimagine how knowledge and learning can shape the future of humanity and the planet. We are looking at 2050 and beyond. And we want to partner with you to discuss, debate and re-envision the ways education enables us to become what we want to become. For ourselves. For each other. Thinking together, so we can act together. Join the conversation and let's make the futures we want. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, I know that uh, last week uh, there was a meeting of Eden Fellows uh, uh, at ICD conference in Dublin on the 5th of uh, um, November on this particular topic. Unfortunately, I couldn't join this meeting and probably I'll get some feedback from you after I make um, a brief um, presentation of uh, the new UNESCO initiative. This is a global initiative, Futures of Education, Learning to Become. This initiative was launched uh, in September and now we are in the pilot stage. Uh, um, and the, uh, the first stage is um, pilot consultations, then uh, there will be uh, 
uh, online consultations, high-level consultations, and in parallel, uh, our team is doing a research on the futures of education. <coughs> so uh, this uh, initiative is uh, aimed to reimagine how knowledge and learning can shape the future of the humanity and the planet, so this is within uh, the values of our organization. Um, and the initiative will uh, generate an agenda for global deba debate uh, in a world uh, with increasing complexity, uncertainty and precarity. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the International Commission will work under the um, leadership of the President of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia and the first uh, meeting of this Commission will take place uh, in January 2020, so uh, between September and December we are working to provide some uh, uh, preliminary ideas uh, and uh, food for thought for this commission. And uh, the members of um, the International Commission are the thought leaders from the world of um, politics, academia, the arts, science, business and education. Mm, so, um, uh, the broad uh, and open uh, consultations will uh, involve youth, educators, civil society, governments, business and other stakeholders. Uh, and now, well, probably I'll provide some more information. Um, so, uh, uh, as uh, you learned from the video, the horizon for the... We don't use here the, the term foresight, uh, but, uh, well, the the futures, the study of the futures. The horizon is 2015 and uh, we are speaking about the futures uh, of education in um, plural because, uh, well, to acknowledge that there are multiple dimensions uh, of the future and, uh, uh, well, they, they can be uh, various desirable and undesirable futures as well. Mm. Con consultations will be uh, um, held uh, across all uh, regions of the world and uh, uh, the project will have uh, iterative and collective approach to generate discussion and action on the role of education, knowledge and learning. Um, actually, the, well, the first phase of research within this project have already uh, revealed several um, uh, trends, external trends affecting, for example, higher education, so uh, widening uh, gap in demography between developed and developing countries, uh, population shifts uh, through increasing uh, globalization and migration, uh, digitalization, uh, shifting uh, labor markets, environmental threats, uh, political instability, um, increased levels of armed conf conflict. And uh, there are uh, internal trends uh, affecting higher education, rapidly uh, expanding uh, enrollments, um, uh, Actually, globally, females participate uh, more in uh, uh, higher education, but less, less so in natural sciences. Uh, there is an increasingly complex set of providers. Um, uh, there is increasing privatization, uh, growing uh, diversification, growing internationalization, increasingly costly uh, higher education system, etc. So, um, in, the, in, in the past our institute has an experience in working in 
futures uh, in studying the futures and we published a book on futures for higher education and ICT changes due to the use of open content. So certainly this um, project will involve a uh, um, include many aspects related to uh, education uh, different, at different uh, levels of education, uh, different forms, traditional and non-traditional issues re related to recognition of uh, learning outcomes uh, obtained uh, using uh, traditional and uh, non-traditional forms of education. Uh, MOOCs, uh, digital competences, etc. So, uh, just uh, uh, to mention um, a few questions to be asked: How to balance the different types of skills that uh, high education should impart for adaptability in the future? How to balance skills with values and ethics? How to balance the human resource development function with education for citizens? And peace. How to balance common public and private good function of, of higher education? How to balance knowledge on local and global realities? How to balance uh, teaching and learning organized through human contact and automated learning? Uh, so, I would like to invite all of you to join in the consultations uh, within this uh, uh, UNESCO initiative. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Svetlana. Very, very uh, nice presentation with inspiring video. I especially like the, the idea of 2050, not 2030, but 2050. Um, so, um, regarding your last comments uh, on balance between different issues, uh, what do you think, uh, how important would be the role of the uh, uh, governments and uh, institution management in uh, maintaining uh, uh, the new ideas, but also in order to perceive, to perceive the, the quality uh, and, and good way uh, of uh, teaching and learning. Well, I, I think that uh, the role of governments is very important in this particular issue. Uh, well, um, well, in some countries, uh, education and in particular higher education is uh, um, decentralized and on autonomous, but in, in many countries it is regulated and sometimes even overregulated, which means that educators need a uh, uh, blessing from above, uh, and uh, well, this is the role of the government to provide this blessing. Yeah, thank you. Although lots of gov governments uh, swear that uh, education is top priority, uh, I can uh, certify from my own country that usually it's only political decision, but not a concrete uh, uh, action. So uh, let's hope it will be it will be better. Uh, please join the others in the chat uh, with comments uh, uh, on, on the topic uh, or topics. Um, let's move on now to the last challenge we are going to present uh, uh, today. Uh, with us is Sally Reynolds, who will present EduHack project from the perspective of how to help teachers to be digitally competent and to provide innovative and interactive learning environment. So, what we have been talking previously by Svetlana, future of education and so on. So you're actually going to give some replies on that. Thank you very much, Sandra. And thank you to Eden and to you for allowing me to join what has been a very interesting webinar this afternoon. I hope you can hear me okay, can you? Very good. Okay. Uh, indeed, I, I don't think we, by any, by any stretch of the imagination, can say we can answer all of the questions you've been talking about, but one that is relevant to us is the question of how to help academic staff to improve their skills and their resources. 
And so I'd like to spend a few minutes with you describing a European project called EduHack EU, uh, which, as you can see from the screen, is all about capacity building for university educators, for academic teaching staff who want to develop their skills. We're coming into our last year of the project, and so uh, we would like to expand our network and to share our materials with you, which is what this short presentation is about. So you can see the partners on the screen and uh, know that this is funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Commission. Um, EduHack is based on a supports and learning approach that is, of course, open, collaborative, active insofar as that we support our learners, our academic staff to experiment, create and reflect themselves. And it's based on what are sometimes called the new literacies. The framework for digital competence that we have based our work on is the DigiComp EDU framework. A little bit earlier, you heard Jonathan talking about JRC's uh, DigiComp uh, framework. This also comes from JRC and the educational framework, and we've based our work very definitely on this framework to, in order to make it a little bit more systematic. Um, what we're offering through this project is, first of all, a freely available online course made up of 19 standalone modules, which are available on the website. I'll give you the address in a moment. They're currently available in English, Spanish, and Italian, but we would love to have them available in other languages, and are looking for partners to help us to develop them in that direction. Uh, we also provide a toolkit providing advice and organizing edgy hackathons with academic teaching staff, and these are events whereby academic staff come together over a short period of time in order to create something together, whether that's an element of a course, a digital approach to accreditation, um, a new resource, whatever. And we also include guides, sample materials and advice. Um, there are also, there's also an online wall and hub available through EduHack and access to an open network of peers and fellow collaborators. And this is a screenshot that you can see of the um, access to the online course which has been divided into these four areas, digital resources, teaching, assessment, empowering learners. And each of these separate parts of the course then have their own separate modules. This is a typical one. This is one in exploring digitally supported assessment strategies. Each of these modules has got an element to read, an element to watch, so a piece of video to watch, and then something active that we invite our participants to actually do so that they have an active learning opportunity themselves. One of our partners has already taken their academics through the, the full cycle with the EduHack materials, and that's Junior in Spain. And they began with an online course offer to their academic teaching staff over a period of approximately two months, whereby their academic staff took part in, took themselves through the various different courses and took part in several webinars. They then prepared a hackathon uh, whereby they worked in groups online in order to identify the topic of activity of the hackathon. Again, a webinar was linked to that. And then they carried out the hackathon over a period of a couple of days. Seven ideas came out of this from four working groups. So this is the, the overall structure of what we like to offer for academic staff to try out. This is um, to give you an example from the EduHack Community Hub, whereby various topics are tagged. So that uh, this one is, is primarily in Spanish, whereby you can, if you are an academic using this course materials, taking part in the hackathon, then when you post online, you can be connected up with others who are posting and using the same tools and trying out the same digital experiences. This is an overview of the structure of the project, whereby the hub, which is at the center of what we're offering to academics teaching staff, which is a knowledge sharing platform, is available. And then feeding into this are the various different activities which universities um, carry out themselves, universities or colleges. And I think what I really wanted to highlight in this short presentation is the fact that we're now heading into the third year of this project, and we've launched an informal network. So this is, by informal, we mean that it's not a network that you, you pay a registration fee to join. It's not a formal network. It is an informal network of peers and, and uh, 
people who are interested in similar activities to ourselves from universities and colleges in different parts of Europe and indeed outside Europe as well. Um, the purpose of this network is to maintain these learning experiences going forward, particularly when the project ends in a year's time, to promote the use of these materials, supporting a community of users, perhaps extend the approach to, for example, making the online resources available in languages other than English, Spanish or Italian, and uh, the advantages to being a member of this informal network is that you will receive regular updates from us, and certainly for this last year of the project, the partners are willing to offer support and advice if you would like to apply a similar approach to upskilling the competences of your academic teaching staff in your university or college. So my last slide, just simply to give you the, uh, the addresses. So first of all, about the project, that's the web address at the top. If you'd like more information and the application form, then the address is there as well. And you can see already which universities and networks have joined the, um, this informal network that we've launched as part of the project. So that's basically, Sandra, what I wanted to cover. Thank you very much. Um, very happy to take any questions. And Thank you, Sally. Very, very good information about this project. Uh, can you tell me, for example, how many teachers or academic staff have passed through this project, because I, if I understand correctly, it's already the third year of the project. How many of them have already passed through the project, and how, what is their feedback uh, on possibilities to attend the courses, uh, participate in the hackathon, and so on? Uh, looking at the, from the partners, because we've been pirating this with the partners so far, there's approximately 100, 150 academic staff have worked their way through the, they either, they don't have to follow the course every single module. They can take a certain number if they like to across the overall structure of the course. And, they, and in junior in Spain. So, so far, we've had about 50 people take part in hackathons directly related to the project once according to these who took part in the very early beta stages as well about a year ago. I think we had about 30 people who took part in that first evaluation. So, it's that kind of number so far. Very good, very good. Um, because uh, uh, um, when I'm thinking about uh, uh, professional development of academic staff, um, my question is, uh, should should it be mandatory or compulsory for teachers? And uh, are they to decide uh, on their own, or should it be initiative for institutions, uh, institution that they should uh, take uh, some training? Uh, we, we lost you, Sally. You are freeze at the moment. Sally, are you with us? We do not hear you. Okay, while well, we get Sally back. Um, so I ask you now in chat, uh, these are the questions topic we have talked about. Please put in the chat what do you think is the biggest challenge uh, which we are going to deal with till 2030. So uh, definitely they are all challenges and issues, very relevant and uh, 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 highly uh, uh, important. But what would be your, uh, uh, your, your, what do you think is the biggest one which is, uh, we are looking forward to, to 2030? So please put your uh, opinion in the chat. We have Sally back. Uh, uh, we, you have Frozen. You know, I know the new, new movie Frozen is coming out, but uh, you, you are frozen already. Uh, so uh, my question was, do you think that uh, teacher training should be compulsory? or it should be left upon teachers to decide on their own? Mm. A great question, that's why I was really disappointed, I suddenly disappeared. Um, just to say, I mean, I think practically every university is running some form of training course, some form of training support for its academics, so in many cases it is already happening. The question as to whether it should be um, obligatory or not is obviously a very sensitive one, and differs from country to country. And I think you also have to look at whether you try to offer this as something that is seen by everybody as just a natural part of the process of when they start to teach 
in academic context. Uh, in my personal opinion, certainly with uh, new staff starting, I think it should be obligatory. I think we have to bite the bullet with training and supporting our academics in helping them to improve their, their teaching skills. Um, what you do with, with academics that have been teaching for several years is, of course, sensitive. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Sally. Now we are going to conclude. I will give my presenters floor for a minute uh, for each presenter to conclude and uh, maybe to highlight what they think is the most important issue relating to the topic they have uh, present, maybe some message for the future. So I would like to start with uh, Irina uh, and then Dean. Uh, what do you think, uh, how will, would you like to conclude uh, the session with the, the message maybe? regarding the topic you presented. Thank you, Sandra. Can you hear me well? Yes. The perspective seems very interesting, but also very diverse. And I agree with Svetlana that there are futures in, um, in, uh, in, in multiple perspectives, not in a single one. But for me, one uh, dimension that I think is quite concrete and already uh, improves uh, the confidence to me when I think of it is that we will have individuals who will be learning, individuals who have their individual profiles, individual preferences. Um, uh, they, they will have very diverse futures themselves as society members and therefore I think it would be a great challenge for us to find different approaches to quality uh, assurance for each individual a perspective and each future of education. Yes, thank you, Irina. Uh, good food for thought. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the individualized learning pathways are definitely something which is raising and how to ensure uh, the good quality uh, during this time. So, Dean, your, your minute for conclusion. Thank you. This has been a very interesting session, so thank you for organizing this today. Um, from my perspective about quality programs from fake ones. It's been a problem for a long time. It is one that has a tendency to be hidden uh, and not talked about. So it comes up occasionally, but the reality is, is that we are having people who are getting fake degrees, who are in very high positions, and in positions where we are talking literally life and death in terms of nurses, medical, and other things. We need to, as institutions, as employers, to be more vigilant about this, to truly check credentials, and to prosecute, and to be very public about it. We'll never get rid of it all. But the more we speak about it, and the more we are public about it, the more we can, um, we can lessen the damage. But I would emphasize that I think employers need to be much more involved in this, as well as the universities to protect their own institutions and their brands. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, important better collaboration between institution, employers, and also legal issues. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, it's up to us to protect uh, integrity of uh, education. Uh, as such. Uh, now I'm giving the floor to Jennifer and then to Svetlana for their conclusion. Thank you. Okay, um, just from my side, I think we all know about the movie What Women Want, but I think we need to concentrate on what do students want. Um, and I think the research has shown strongly that students want a form or a sense of identity, a sense of belonging. And I think we're very fortunate that we have the technology now to provide that. But as educators, as lecturers, we have to buy into that ourselves first and understand and, and accept and know the value of, 
of, of interaction and group work and cooperation and collaboration. It starts with us because if we can't provide that sense of belonging to the students, it's never going to work. So it's a challenge out there to all education providers to accept the, um, the views of the cooperative learning experts and let's challenge ourselves that we can be out there for those students. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Very good. So, Svetlana, regarding the future of education, you, you already got very, got very good introduction by Jennifer. Uh, well, I, I think that we had a very interesting uh, webinar today, and the issues related to the quality of online materials and uh, the, uh, the quality of skills obtained by students and the, well I was really impressed by the presentation by Dean about the, the bulk of focus universities and diplomas and certificates and well actually the, uh, some measures should be taken and we should uh, foresee or develop some actions to well to make uh, the certification more reliable Thank you, Svetlana, very much for good uh, resume. Uh, yes. So now we are going to uh, Jonathan, and after that to Sally. So MOOCs are here to stay. Credentializing is very important. We have already said individualized learning pathways, quality of learning materials, and distinction between fake and uh, real one. So Jonathan, what is your resume regarding the presentation you had? Um, I think for the future will be very important the competence, the competences that individuals, that learners have, because in the future it's going to be a lot of, it's going to coexist a lot of different learning options, open, closed, in an ecosystem, and it's very important that the people have digital skills, self-regulation skills, learning to learn skills, to be able to take advantage of all, all the existing courses. It will allow also to distinguish about the quality of the courses. Individuals are a quality controller, very good if they have the skills to do it. It will allow to interact online also if you have the digital skills and the interactions skills would be more easier to get benefits from the online learning. So for me it's very important to develop competences that individuals can use to benefit in this ecosystem. Thank you. We have introduction to Sally digital competences what we need. So Sally, you have already said uh, importance of education of uh, academic staff. So basically, you got the introduction. <laughs> so <laughs> what is your one-minute conclusion? I, I just think listening to this discussion where quality just keeps coming back all the time. I think for me, quality is a bottom-up strategy. I think until such time as, in, in that case, our area of interest, academic staff are really self-critical and self-reflecting and really look at themselves and how they present and how they lead the learning process, that it's quite difficult to even start to talk to them about improving their competences. I'm always amused by the number of times if you ask an academic, for example, just to simply record themselves and to watch their video afterwards, they go, oh no, I can't possibly do that. And um, I'm not saying everyone should be watching themselves on video all day, but it's just the ability to be able to look at yourself, to examine how it is your teaching, how you set up your learning environment for your students, how you put in place that interaction, that personalization that was mentioned by Jennifer, until such time as we really have that as something, as, as a key competence that our academic staff and all of us have, I think it's very hard to talk about quality. Yeah, thank you. Very good, Rizine. Uh So we have come to the end of uh, our session today. Uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, my presenters globally from America, South Africa, Europe. Uh, did, I, did I forget someone? But okay, uh, let's see that we have different uh, challenges ahead of us. We provided really good examples uh, about these channel challenges in how uh, to overpass them, how to look forward uh, to um, fight with these challenges. Um, I also thank all the participants for really uh, engaging discussion in the chat and participation. 
Um, I invite you to further attend the, the seminars, uh, uh, sessions uh, today. The, first, uh, the next session is at 6 uh, uh, p.m. Where it will be talk about future uh, of distance education universities. Uh, also, uh, the session is recorded. It will be posted on the Eden web. If you have registered to the session, and uh, you will receive an open badge for participation. If you haven't, uh, please, uh, you can re register at this, uh, I will share with you at this link. Yeah, uh, even Secretariat has already put it in the chat. So if you want to receive a badge, please register. And please continue to follow uh, uh, the sessions and to contribute. It's very important that we talk about this and to raise awareness about uh, issues relating distance and e-learning. Thanks all again for a very, very nice webinar. Greetings from Zagreb, Croatia. Bye.